So then the question came to me, do I believe in God? And I don't like that question. And people have complained at me a lot, and I'm sure they have their reasons because they don't like my answers, you know, and I, I have two answers. They've kind of become stock, which is not a good thing. But, um, but they're the best approximate. I, I, I can't figure out why I don't like the question exactly. I've got three, I had three sort of burgeoning hypotheses. One was, it's none of your damn business. That's the first one. So it was like a privacy issue. Like it seemed to me to be a question that was too private to be answered properly. And so, and you know, you could consider that a cop-out, and maybe it is. And then another one was, um, well, what do you mean by believe? Like, do you mean the words? Do you mean to say the words, I believe in God? Does that indicate that you believe in God? Like, I don't know what you mean by believe exactly, because, and that's got me in trouble too, because, you know, people think that attempting to clarify the meaning of words is an attempt to escape from the question when it's actually an attempt to specify the question. I mean, is what you believe what you say or what you act out? Now, you know, I would say to some degree it's both, but if push comes to shove, as far as I'm concerned, what you believe is what you act out, not what you say. And then, you know, and if you're an integrated person, then what you act out and what you say are the same thing, and then you're a person whose word can be trusted, right? Because what you say and what you do are isomorphic, they're the same thing. But it, belief is instantiated in action, so I, I, I have also suggested that I act as if I believe in God, or to the best of my ability. And uh, people aren't very happy with that either, but... And then the third is that I'm afraid that he might exist, which I think is the most comical of the three answers, and perhaps the most accurate one. But then... But then, I was thinking about this today, when I was thinking about what I might talk to you guys about, and I thought, well, let's go into this a little bit more. Um, Let's say you say you do believe in God. You say, I believe in God. It's like, okay, well that's hypothetically pretty impressive, I would say. It's like, you believe that there's a divine power that oversees everything, that is fundamentally ethical, that's watching everything you do, and, um, and you believe that. And so, what effect does that have on your behavior, if, if you believe it? Does that mean that you're well, are you, full, are you all in on your beliefs? Are you sacrificing everything to this transcendent entity that you proclaim belief in? Have you cleansed yourself of all your sin, let's say? Are you making all the sacrifices that you need to make? Like, have you taken the moat out of your eye? No. Or, 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 or are you in the same situation, let's say, that the Catholic Church seems to be in right now? just out of curiosity. It's a good time to bring that up, since the Pope seems to be concerned with what's been happening um, with the Catholic Church, given the endless pedophilic scandals, let's say, which seem rather serious in my estimation, and might have been something that was cleaned up perhaps a hundred or a thousand years ago, and it's being taken seriously perhaps now, and perhaps not, because it's not so easy to determine exactly what it would mean to take that seriously. And you might say, well, are all the people who are committing these heinous actions and then covering them up, are, if you ask them, well, do you believe in God? What are they going to say? Well, you'd think the answer would be yes, given that they're, like, priests. And, and yet... And yet... What's the evidence? Well, the evidence isn't exactly so clear that the mere statement, let's say, or the mere acting out of the ritual, let's say, and, and I, I'm not trying to denigrate the statement or the ritual, but I'm pointing out that that's no indication of your right to say that you believe. Because you got to, and I think this is why it's bothered me to answer this question. It's like, well, what right do I have to say that? To make that claim, I believe in God. Well, what's the claim? Is that the claim that I'm a good person somehow? Because you'd think that if you believed in God, actually, like, like seriously, that you'd be a good person, like, right now. Because, well, 
Well, for obvious reasons, I would think. And so if that hasn't happened in some sort of miraculous sense, so that you're the best person you could possibly imagine being on an ongoing basis, and then terrified of, of deviating from that path in a serious manner, then I don't see why you have the right to say that you believe in God. You know, one of the things Nietzsche said about Christianity, he was a great critic of Christianity, although also a great friend in a, in a very peculiar way, um, in that sometimes your best friend is the one who points out your weakest um, properties, let's say. He said as far as he was concerned, there was only one Christian and he died on the cross. And, and that's, that's a, you know, perhaps an extreme statement, but one worth giving some consideration to. It's like, well, then you look at what are, what are you called upon, let's say, if you're going to proclaim yourself as a believer, you know? And, and I thought about this a lot as I've gone through the Old Testament. I did a bunch of lectures last year, and so what are you called upon? Well, you're called upon initially to act out the spark of divinity that's within you by confronting potential with the logos that's within you, which means to take the opportunities that are in front of you, the potential future, and to transform it into the present in the best possible way using truth and courage and careful articulation as your, as your, as your, as your, as your guide. So that's the first thing you're called on to do. That, that's a major deal there. That's a tough one. And then the second is to make the proper sacrifices. That's the Cain and Abel story. It's like you, you want something. You genuinely want it. You want to set the world straight. Then you let go of what's necessary and you pursue. You let go of what isn't necessary, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. And then you pursue what's necessary. And then maybe you sacrifice your children to God. That, that was the story. Um, that's the, one of the next stories that comes up, of course, and you think, well, that's pretty damn barbaric, and the way the story's laid out, of course it is, but um, that isn't exactly what it means. It means that what you try to do when you raise children is that you try to do everything you can to impress upon them by imitation and by instruction and by love and by encouragement that they are crucial beings in the world whose ethical decisions play an important role in shaping the structure of reality itself and that they have the moral responsibility to do that. And you get your ark in order, that's your family, let's say, so that when the storms come, you can stay above water for the 40 days of flooding and you're capable of leading your people through the desert when the desert makes itself manifest and you can escape from tyranny properly because you're wise enough to see it. And you take the full burden of being on yourself, all the suffering that's that's part and parcel of that. You accept that voluntarily, let's say, and you do everything you can to confront the malevolence that's part of you and that's part of the state and that's part of the world. And you, you, you make a garden around you. That's the paradise, a walled garden. It's a walled, well-watered place. So the forces of nature and society exist together in harmony and you place your family in that so that they can live properly. And you treat your enemy as if he's yourself and the same with your brother. And well, then you can say, then maybe you can say, maybe then you have the right to say, that you believe in God. Otherwise, maybe you should think twice about it. Because, you know, there's a line in the New Testament that Christ himself says. Two of them, I should read them too, because they're very relevant to this. Um, I guess I could paraphrase, paraphrase them. Uh, a rich man comes up to Christ and says, and, and says, good, good leader, good Lord, and he asks him a question about how it is that he should be a good person. And Christ says, don't call me good. There's no one that's good but God. And, you know, if that's worth thinking about. I mean, the one person that in principle, in our ancient stories, had the right to make some direct connection between himself and the divine was unwilling to do it when challenged. And so it might be reasonable to assume that each of us could be much more cautious about making that sort of statement bluntly when we're asked. Um, and then the other line is, um, 
Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Got that about right? Which means something approximating just because you make a claim to moral virtue, let's say, your belief in God, which I, th- I, I can't see the, the, how you can make a higher claim to moral virtue than that. You know, I mean, agnostic, atheistic, I, I don't really care. The, the, the purpose, the point is something like this. You imagine something of ultimate transcendent value. I don't care whether you believe in it or not, but imagine that something like that exists, and then you swear allegiance to it, which is to say, I believe in this, I mean, there's a heavy moral burden that comes along with that just to allow yourself to utter the words without feeling that you should be immediately struck down appropriately by lightning. And so, well, and so I think that's why that question makes me uncomfortable. It's that I don't think I have a... I don't think I have a right to make that proclamation. There's another thing, too, that I learned when I was going through these biblical lectures. It was a fascinating thing to do. Um, it was the story of Jacob, who became Israel. And Jacob was a real trickster, you know. He, he was a morally ambiguous figure, to, to put it mildly. I mean, he tricked his older brother out of his birthright. And he was full of tricks. And he had a lot of tricks played on him, too, and maybe learned something as a consequence. Anyways, after running away from his brother who had murderous thoughts and for good reasons for I like about 20 years maybe it was only 14 but doesn't matter it was a long time he decided that he would go back and try to make peace and he, he came to this river he sent his family across the river along with his belongings um, and and uh, partly as an offering to his brother a peace offering and he had a, a dream dream visionary experience hallucination God who knows what it was And he dreamt that he wrestled with an angel all night. And that the angel was God. And God, he won. Which is very strange. Because, well, first of all, he was a trickster figure. You know, like, he wasn't your most upstanding moral creature. He wasn't Noah, for example. And second, well, it was God. You know, it's like, if you're going to wrestle with someone and lose... There's an opponent that's likely to take you out. And he did damage his hip. I mean, so, which is not not that impressive an accomplishment on God's part, in my estimation. But, but, and it's a very interesting story, because what it does indicate, what's so cool about it, you see, Jacob's name is changed at that point to Israel. And Israel means those who wrestle with God. And then that's so... That blew me away. That's one of the things I love about studying old stories is now and then you come across a piece of one and you, and you see in and into it. You know, you, you see down into the depths that, that characterizes it. It's very difficult, but it happens sometimes. And it just flattens you. You know, to think that if Israel is the, is the, cho- if Israel is the chosen people of God, that's the hypothesis, and what Israel means is those who wrestle with God, then think that that gives that seems to me to be such a hopeful idea because well everyone does that to some degree I mean it, it, you do that in your life because well you don't know what's a fundamental transcendent worth you know because who the hell are you and what do you know you know you're you're struggling all the time with well I would say with good and evil when you're struggling with yourself you're struggling with the world to 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 portray that as wrestling with God that's perfectly reasonable from a metaphoric perspective. Um, and the idea that that's what characterizes the true people of God is that willingness to wrestle. That's really something because it, 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 it kind of indicates that you're here as a contender, you know? You're not here to be happy. You're not here to be complacent. You're not here to be materially satisfied. Not that that would be possible. Anyways, but that you're here to contend with the structure of reality, right? And that's what'll satisfy you, because there's something to you. You know, you're not weak and nothing. There's something to you. There's certainly something malevolent and terrible. I mean, you know that. You look at how people behave. You you look at the blood and catastrophe of our history. You can certainly see the the absolute the absolute hellish depths of the human soul, but there's, there's something that t- 
takes root in that and grows up out of that that's absolutely magnificent beyond belief and that's looking for, for to contend. You know, and I've often thought that I've been fortunate in my marriage because you think, well, you, got, you get married and you live happily ever after. It's like... That's not it, is it? You don't want that even. You don't want, what do you want? If you want your partner to do just... All she's going to do is sprinkle rose petals in front of you, right? And pat you on the back of the head and tell you how wonderful you are constantly, day after day. Man, you'd be so sick of that after two... Well, maybe it'd take a month. But, <laughs> but let's say two weeks. It'd be, you'd be... Because you know she should be more on the side of who you c- could be than on the side of who you are. And if she's deluded enough or terrified enough to worship you in your current form, then, well, that doesn't say much for her. And it certainly isn't very helpful for you. You want someone that's going to get in the way now and then, you know, and, and to contend with. And I've been fortunate in my marriage because I have someone to contend with. You know, we, we have our, our discussions and they're not easy. Well, partly because we have hard problems to solve, because life is full of hard problems. I want someone who will stand up, you know, and, and have her say, even if it's not what I would say. And maybe I'm even willing at times, because she's quite intuitive and a good dreamer, and I'm more facile verbally. And so we have to be careful in our relationship, because if I'm in a particularly ornery mood, and she has something to say, I can usually slice up her arguments verbally, you know. And, and that's, that's fine as far as I'm concerned, because I get to win. But it's stupid. <laughs> well, it's stupid. It's, first of all, that doesn't mean I'm right. It just means I can formulate verbal arguments slightly faster than she can. But her intuitions and her dreams are often extraordinarily accurate. And so we've learned to to some degree, to buttress each other's arguments just on the off, off chance that the person that you were foolish enough to marriage, marry might know something you don't now and then about something important, you know? And, and so what do you want? Well, you want someone to contend with. And then it's an adventure, you know? And then you have someone that you love and that you respect And that's not a bad combination for longevity of relationship. And then maybe if you have someone that you love and respect and that you can communicate with, then your children also love and respect her or him. And then that's pretty good for them because they've got some parents that they could love and respect. That's a good combination. You know, it it solidifies their life. And so you want to contend with them. And you want a job that's challenging, I would say, that pushes you beyond what you already are. And God only knows how much, how hard you need to be pushed in order to go beyond where you are. But, you know, to some degree, if you have a choice, you know, it's not that uncommon that what we'll do is choose to be pushed to the limit. Especially when we're at our best. We think, wow, where's the limit? It's here. Maybe I can manage that. I'm going to push myself right to the damn limit. Then I'm going to push myself a little bit over just to see if it's possible. And and if if that happens, then, you know, you emerge with a sense of of triumph. I'm now more than I was, right? And maybe that's what you're here to be, is to be more than you were, right? To push those limits. And to do that, you contend with the world. You wrestle with God. You don't casually say, I believe. Because who knows? No one, no one knows, right? We're separated from the infinite by death and ignorance. We don't know. We contend. We wrestle. You know, and in that maybe we find our destiny. We, at least we find our purpose. We find something that's, that, that justifies us to some degree. You know, if, if I'm awake at night, wondering, and I think, God, you know, like, I, I pushed myself as far as I could in this effort, whatever the effort that I'm considering happens to be. I pushed myself. I don't have a weight on my conscience because I let something go or I failed to accomplish something. I mean, I do often have those sorts of weights. I'm talking about the rare times when I don't. It's like, well, there's something that, that that's where there's some atonement and some peace as far as I'm concerned where that contending and that wrestling has been successful. And I would say that insofar as you're deeply involved in that, like completely involved in that, thoroughly involved in that, 
then you have the right to say that you believe in God. And since I'm not like that 100% of the time, or even approximating the percent of the time that I would like to be like that, you know, despite my best efforts, then when people ask me, I'm not going to say something virtuous, like I'm a believer, because there's plenty wrong with me that needs to be fixed before I would dare utter words like that. Thank you. Well, so that's a better answer to that question. So, thank you very much for...